We do see mountains throughout the Maldives, right from the very far north, right down to the very far south. I've just given a few locations, about 29 um, locations which I've studied or visited on a regular basis. Um, and there is a trend for where they're seen, which is not really surprising based on the fact that we have two very distinct monsoons. So when we have the northeast monsoon, the mountains are seen on the lee side of the, of the atolls and on the lee side of the Maldives. So for instance, this time of year, the best time to see mantas are on the, the west side of Ra and Ba and Ari, um, you know, uh, Nilandi and, uh, and so forth. Whereas in the southwest monsoon, it's the opposite. They're seen frequently on the east side of um, the, the northern atolls, certainly through Mali, South Mali, Falido, et cetera. Uh, and it, you know, to a certain extent on the east side of Ari. So, the mantas are seen on the lee side on a general basis, and this is because that is where the plankton is. On the windward side, we're getting very blue, clear water coming through the atolls, being blown in from the Indian Ocean, and there's very little food available for them. I'm just going to give you a little um, evidence to support that. So, when we were starting to look at um, or investigate this phenomenon, um, we looked at two sites which we dive year round, and so we were surveying throughout the year, and uh, we had Langhan, which is in the, on the east side of North Mali, and Kalahandi, which is on the west side of Ari, which we, we like to visit all the time. And what, we, what I've done here is uh, looked at the, uh, the number of mantas that we see on any particular survey uh, during those periods. Um, so, for instance, in Langhan, you don't usually see mantas from January through March, certainly, or very, very low numbers. Whilst throughout the southwest monsoon months, we see quite a few. You know, generally, we'll see mountains at that site. And the opposite situation is true in um, Kalahandi. So in the northeast monsoon, we'll see mountains, whereas in the southwest monsoon months, we don't see mountains. Um, and these have been tested by chi squares, and these do show a significant bias, so we can say that the, the evidence supports this theory that mantas are seen on the lee side. Uh, also, just looking at the number of uh, surveys that we do, because the problem is we don't tend to go to the cleaning station areas when there's no mantas, so we do less surveys. But even if you sort of work up the correlations with the number of surveys that you do, it's still very strongly supported. So you're looking at 138 to 1 chance, you know, so it's, it's a strong correlation that mantas are seen on the lee side. And just a little bit of explanation of why this happens. Um, the Maldives creates a, a plateau, you know, this um, mount, underwater mountain range in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the island mass effect, what happens here is we have water flowing in one direction. So, for instance, at this time of year it's coming from the east, so it'll be blowing from the east, whoops, uh, blowing from the east across the Maldives, so in this direction. And what will happen is this side will be clear water will be blown in, and on this side, as the water, the currents push out, it actually sucks up nutrients from the deeper water. And this nutrient is sucked into the western side of the atolls, and it creates nutrients for the corals and feeds the fish, so the whole food chain is supplied. And this food offshore, in this uh, offshore, is the food which the mantas feed on, and also the upwellings sucking zooplankton into the atolls, so feeding is seen in shallow waters on this side. And so the mantas will spend with their time where the food is, so it makes sense that they will be seen on the opposite side of the atolls in the direction of the wind. Um, this was um, supported by uh, um, chlorophyll uh, photographs from um, the area around the Maldives, uh, so in the northeast monsoon, this time of year we'll have wind blowing in from the east and the effect is that we have stronger plankton on the west side and vice versa in the southwest monsoon. I'd just like to point something out. You notice that uh, Hoobadoo at this time of year has a strong effect, whereas Hoobadoo in the southwest monsoon seems to have a much lesser effect. And it does appear that the atolls around the equator have a much less effect from the southwest monsoon compared with the central atolls. And this may be one of the reasons why, uh, at the moment, uh, Hoobadoo 
seems to be a big question mark about where are all the mantas. <laughs> there are, you know, we, we know that there are some mantas there because they are seen feeding in some of the shallow lagoons, but uh, there is still not much success in tracking down regular locations where mantas can be seen. So manta rays are usually seen on the lee side of the atolls in the monsoon winds, um, but you know, when we have a changeover of seasons, um, for instance, um, April, November, um, the winds can blow in either direction and that messes things up. So we haven't got this nice consistent um, island mass effect, so the plankton moves around and so do the animals. Um, and it is the same animals which are observed on one side of the atoll to the other. And we've performed this, done, we know this from studies in North Mali, which I'm going to go on to. So we know it's the same animals which will travel from one side of the atoll to the other. It's not like the mantis only feed for six months of the year and then go hungry for six months or do something else for six months. They are feeding, so they're just moving where the food is. Um, there are some locations like Razdu Atoll, like Razdu North Channel, where um, they, the channel site location doesn't seem to quite match the theory. Uh, but they're never, all, they're never completely windward during that period. And it's probably that shapes of reefs nearby are sort of siphoning up or scooping up the plankton, you know, using this mass of the island mass effect. And you would need somebody who is a, an expert in currents and engineering and water movement to actually do a proper analysis. And the Maldives is such a huge geographical area, this will keep, you know, 20 PhDs um, busy for a long time. Okay, so good luck. <laughs> okay. So, I was going back to Mali um, at all. So this is some of the supporting evidence we've got um, for the movements of individual mantas. So what we have, th this is a discovery curve of individuals that we knew from Langhan being sighted on the west side of Bodohiti. And this was the actual, you know, the number of surveys that we conduct and how many mantas we've seen. And we've basically shown that for every time, for every 10 surveys, we see a mixture of 27 mantas. And Again, based on a, an approximate population of about 500 mantas in North Mali Atoll, if we did the same number of surveys at, uh, around the Bodhihiti area as we did at Langkan, we would actually see all the mantas we've ever seen at Langkan. So it does you know, support the theory that the mantas are the same mantas and go from one side of the atoll to the other with a change of seasons. The other interesting thing is that the same mantas do sit, tend to be seen at the same cleaning station over and over again. Uh, and the, the number of mantas which are kind of connected with the cleaning station varies massively. So one of the reasons why we tend to go to the same cleaning station and why divers love the same places to visit. Um, so for instance, uh, Table Tilo is, is often known as Don Carlo. I differentiated it from the actual reef which was in the books as Don Carlo, but it's, it's basically the reef south, uh, the, 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 the smaller Tilo south in the same Malos channel, anyway. Um, so, that for, for whatever reason, that site over the years has been my most prolific site for seeing manta rays. And I have 604 mantas which I was first saw there, uh, which is a, a large number. And then we're looking at sort of 250 from Anivaru, 400 from Lankan, 300 from Bodohiti. It just goes on and on and on. So there seems to be quite a high um, affinity to particular sites. And the interesting thing with um, places like Table Tiller, now that site doesn't really work and I've had relatively low sightings or re-sightings of those individuals at other cleaning stations nearby. So although we visit places like Manigar and Kalahandi, also in Ariato, the vast majority of the mantas that we first saw at Table Tiller, we haven't seen again. They are still turning up. In fact, I had a sighting last week for one I haven't seen for 12 years. But, you know, they, they, we, they seem to have been lost to us. And so this, again, suggests high affinity, but we haven't worked the statistics yet. Um, and very simply, uh, you, if you don't visit a site a lot, you won't get much results, and that's really obvious. And so other areas which we don't visit very often, we've got a very low set of uh, re-sightings. And we hope that the, the studies that we're doing through the IUCN uh, will uh, increase the number of surveys performed in some of these outer atolls so that we can, again, provide some better evidence. Um, and yes, and I just said that we, we do see animals after a gap of maybe 10, 12 years. It's very easy to re-recognize re them, and uh, yes, they do keep on appearing. So old data, old photographs and so forth, very useful for sort of seeing where the animals are moving to or have been. Uh, as I said already, we know that mantas clean approximately once a week, but that is very average. 
um, and uh, that's a paper which is just in review. Okay, so just, this is just some, some data about what we've seen and the number of individuals that we've seen between particular sites. So what we have here is a graph of some of the central atolls, and this is taken from um, some data from 2007. I could have given you some more recent one, but it doesn't actually change very much. The, the important thing is it's the Mali area where we're getting the, 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 the majority of recitings at different sites. So the, what these numbers refer to is the number of individuals that we've seen going from one place to another. So for instance, between uh, Lang Langkan and Bodhihitsi, we're looking at 97 different mantas. Um, between Sunlight and Bodhihitsi, there's about 12 different mantas, etc. And the, the number of mantas which have gone to other atolls is very small. Um, that is because generally, we have smaller numbers of data from the other atolls, which I hope to change once we've got more information from other atolls. Um, but it does seem that the, the movement is within a single atoll, and very small levels of movement between atolls. So not many mountains jump between Ari and Nali. Um, surprisingly small, I haven't got any data from on this graph, but that the, the number of animals that we've seen from North Mali to South Mali is particularly small, and that is, to me, surprising. Okay, so just going to show the bigger graph, it's a bit easier to see. Um, but we do have individuals that uh, make uh, little treks between Mali sites all the way up to Bar and come back again. And I know that Guy Stevens um, in the Manta Trust, uh, one of his observations was of a single individual that went all the way from Langhan up to uh, Hanifaru and back in like a, you know, a sort of 24, 48 hour period. So they do travel quite a lot of distances, they will move very quickly between these sites. Um, the assumption is they're moving between feeding areas, but to, to do an 80 kilometer one way and 80 kilometer back uh, for, for no apparent reason is quite interesting. And I suppose the, you just have to appreciate that, similar to us, they, they, some individuals like to move around and some individuals like to stay put. And there's always going to be a variety of behavior between individuals. Okay, so we, this supports a hypothesis that there is an east and west site for each animal. So that the animals move from east and west, um, that the, the changes in them soon. Um, and that there is some movement between sites either in an atoll or in between atolls. But like I said, the uh, number of animals moving between atolls is very small. Um, these are some, some slightly more extreme ones. So, so I mentioned the one, uh, the animal which has been up to bar and back again. We have a couple of individuals doing that. We also have animals which move up and down the west side of Ari and down to Nalandi. Um, and animals which move between Ari, Nalandi and Mali. And then the slightly more extreme ones. I had an individual which went from uh, the west side of Ari all the way up to Haralifu, which is about 300 kilometers. And again, Gus Stevens has reported uh, an individual which has travelled all the way from um, Bar all the way down to Abdu. So that is kind of our longest travelling, longest distance travelling mantle. Okay. So just using the 300 kilometres, um, I've done a sort of, okay, I bet it's hard to see actually. But this, this is 300 kilometres uh, in diameter around the north of the Maldives and 300 kilometres in diameter around the south of the Maldives. And certainly this encompasses the Lakshadweep group islands and the uh, western coast of India. There's not too much of a stretch to think that individuals would travel from the west coast of India and across to Sri Lanka um, and, uh, and maybe even jump to the Seychelles, possibly. Okay, so just um, as going back onto Manterbury Rostrus, we don't get many Manterbury Rostrus in the Maldives, so I just want to uh, point out where they, they have been seen. Um, and it's nothing really special in the sites. You know, they've been seen in Hanifaru, they've been seen at the cleaning stations down the west side of, of um, Ariato, at Ravdu, um, quite common down at Fawamala and down at um, Abdu. Uh, we, we're, there are slightly more remote oceanic sites. Uh, but they do seem to pop up at the same cleaning stations as where Manta Alfredi turns up. So this, to, at this point, we have no recitings of any of the Verostris. So it appears that they pass through the Maldives and move on. So they are transient visitors, um, hence their term, the name, the oceanic manta. This is what suits their sort of oceanic lifestyle, living in deep water, just hopping between island groups. OK, 
Okay, we also made some population studies in the Maldives, so we knew the number of mantis we were looking at. Um, we looked at, we used Peterson's and Jolly Seaver methods to estimate. The, the Jolly Seaver, so the, the Peterson's assumes a closed population, so we're not having animals leaving or joining, whereas um, Jolly Seaver accounts for um, deaths and uh, emigrants. Uh, and we used samples from our cleaning station visits. And because it's cleaning stations, we're only really testing adult populations. So we're not really catching the juveniles because they live in the shallow lagoons, and at this stage we weren't sampling those. Um, the estimates varied uh, quite widely. We've got Peterson's estimates for uh, North Mali, you know, anything between sort of 600 and 2,000. Um, Ari around, you know, 1 to 2,000. And um, Bar, anything up to 2 and a bit thousand. <laughs> so we're looking at this, a very wide variation. But this is, you know, about giving an estimate of populations. Um, the, the Jolly Seaver gave the other extreme as far as much smaller populations. And what we quickly realised that the, the populations, um, the, the actual samples that we were using, when we were looking at the, using the Peterson samples, we were probably looking at more of an adult population, whereas the Jolly Seaver ones were probably looking at the population of animals in the vicinity of a particular cleaning station um, at any one particular time. Um, but it does make you appreciate that, uh, you know, maybe thousand animals in the vicinity of a cleaning station on a particular day, which is quite incredible. Um, but not, you know, knowing the numbers that you can see at certain sites, that's not unrealistic. Just to give you some backup on, on those, uh, the, the estimates, these are actual sightings of numbers of mountains that we've seen. So this is the number of surveys we conducted in the atoll, this is the number of individuals. So if I start with Mali, this is the dark dots. So the, the line is, is increasing quite uniformly but it's pretty much reached an asymptote, which is when it flattens out. And this would suggest that we've got a population of around 700 mountains. Um, in Ari, um, less surveys conducted, but um, a steeper um, slope, and again, maybe an asymptote at around 800 or so, but it's, it's still kind of bumping on. When you get the arrows are days when we made intense surveys. And on those days, we did tend to find quite large populations of individuals, so the numbers added on those days were very high. And then Bar Atoll, um, this was a very short period of survey, just for a few years in, in uh, sorry, a few weeks in 2009, really. And um, this is a very steep slope, um, and we know that Bar has at least a population of 250 mountains and probably nearer 600. Okay. Um, we tested the, 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 the best estimate of population with the geographical area and found a very strong correlation. Bear in mind that we've only got three atolls in this test, but the, the, the correlation was actually very good. Um, because there's only three um, sites, we only have um, one degree of freedom, so the, the variation could be quite high. Um, but you know, the, the strength of that um, relationship suggested that we could actually estimate the population for the Maldives based on the geographical area. Um, so there we go, there's our estimate for each atoll, which gives us a total estimate of about 6,500 mountains for the Maldives. So I said, that's adult mountains, okay, so it doesn't include juveniles. And if we took that um, further and said, uh, if we use the one, the, the, the maximum adult population um, based on that using the, the one um, degree of freedom, that we would estimate a population of maximum 10,000 adults. Okay, 10,000 manta rays. I don't know how you feel about that, but um, it do doesn't sound like very many. So, moving on. Manta tourism, very important uh, activity in the Maldives because it is economically important. Uh, a recent study shows that uh, at least $8 million in direct revenue uh, based on uh, a very simple costing for every tourist that went diving or snorkeling with mantas um, that they spent between $45 and $75 a dive and uh, about $20 a snorkel to go and see manta rays. This is the money that they only spent on that activity. So the money spent to the, the, um, the dive centre uh, just for the, for the diving activity. The Maldives sells itself on having a pristine marine environment um, and often sells its, uh, the, the, the tourism from 
promotion is on come and dive with the mantas, come and see our beautiful waters, so forth. So this is, a, you know, a, this is something which the government is actively pushing, and I'm sure those of you who work on resorts or have um, you know, relations that work with resorts, they, you, you know that the visitors come and talk about the beautiful lagoons, the fact that they want to see sharks, they want to see mantas. It is very important that we preserve this and project uh, a good, healthy, marine environment. Okay, so diving with mantas and uh, whale sharks is, as I said, an important tourism activity. This is uh, the lagoon at um, Hanifaru. Um, this has been probably our showpiece um, to the world, uh, maybe how to do it and how not to do it. Um, you know, mantas are very regularly seen in the lagoon. The numbers of mantas that visit on a daily basis vary very significantly from one day to the next and even during, throughout a day. Um, but we know that the tourism impact um, was becoming too great uh, and it was scaring, probably scaring the mountains away. And so the decision was taken to restrict access to snorkeling only and um, to restrict the numbers of, of uh, divers, snorkelers that were allowed in the lagoon. Um, I said this kind of activity is very, very important and we must do everything we can to protect it. But we also need to evaluate these activities and understand you know, what is the risk to the animal and you know, how can we manage this in an effective way. Um, at this point, I don't think that there is any published evidence that uh, scuba diving with manta rays um, affects their behaviour. In fact, they seem to actively seek out scuba divers at certain sites. Um, they hang in bubbles. And I know they're at cleaning stations rather than feeding areas, but certainly from the lagoon feeds um, that we attend, the, the mantas are very inquisitive of the bubbles, they often play in the bubbles, etc. As I said, further evaluation needs to be done. And I think that people who work in Bar might say that, you know, that, that the current situation with Hanifa Road is not where we want to be and it does need to be re-evaluated. But that also goes for other areas where mantas are seen in the Maldives. We know that there is other busy manta ray sites um, have been affected. Now if we're going to carry on promoting the Maldives as as places to see manta rays and uh, you know, snorkel with mantas and so forth. We do need to know more about it, and this is where you know, citizen science comes in, um, that anyone that works on resorts, um, anyone who sees mantas or goes snorkeling with mantas, etc., can help you know, report their sightings so that we can evaluate what the real situation is and you know, get a better handle on that, uh, that number of, of the population. You know, are we really looking at you know, six and a half maximum 10,000 mantas in the Maldives, or you know, we got our sums wrong. So, in summary, we have both species of manta in the Maldives, um, but the, the smaller species, manta alfredi, is the most commonly reported species. We know that manta rays live to quite an old age. They don't mature until they're between 10 and 15 years old, um, and you know, that an adult female it, with a pregnancy of 12 months, or 12 and a half months, will probably have pregnancies quite infrequently. Uh, a little bit like a human being, we don't tend to get, you know, female adults don't tend to get pregnant every year because it's really hard work being pregnant and then bringing up the offspring. Okay, they don't have to bring up the offspring, but just being pregnant puts them at much more risk of being attacked by large sharks. So the, um, the reproductive rate is going to be low in this species. Um, that the manta alfredi here are, although we have mantas probably in every atoll of the Maldives, they are limited to a particular atoll. And disturbances in an atoll, you know, resort development, um, fishing activities, lots of other things can influence um, the individual mantas because they do tend to be atoll based. Um, but we know that in the, um, the in central atolls there is migration from one, from one season to the other, they move across the atolls and it changes with the monsoon. So things to consider there. Um, and we have a population of between six and a half and absolute maximum 10,000 mantas. Um, and finally, that you know, mantas are important to the economy here and to the perception of a, a pristine environment.